Welcome to another Six Patterns video. My name is Max. I'm Kevin. And uh, we have another one of our series of the top 25 pearls of pulmonary pathology here. And we've got this nice needle core biopsy. Which pearl is this? Thank you for the reminder. <laughs> this is pearl number three. Pearl number three. Out of 25. Yes. This specimen comes from a 62-year-old male. Wow. Okay. And that's the only history we have. Year old male. It's the only history we have. Do we, we need have. any other history? Remember that. It's a great question. The, the, we're grouping these uh, these pearls under headings. Yep. And this the heading for this might be something like knowing what the biopsy technique is and how it influences your, your decision interpretation. In the case. Yeah. That's exactly right. And we can say from the picture you have on your screen that this is a needle biopsy. Who does needle biopsies, Max? Certainly, it's not someone who's interested in making a diagnosis of interstitial lung disease. Correct. Never used in the U.S. for interstitial lung disease. So anytime in the United States, or Canada probably, right. yeah. if you see a needle core biopsy, you know the clinical history, which is spectacular. We're always complaining as pulmonary not pathologists, we don't have enough history, we don't have enough history. The needle core is perfect because it tells us exactly what we need to know. There was a target. There's a target, and the most important thing you can do on needle core biopsy is to be sure that this corresponds to a mass lesion right. by imaging. Right. Once you've confirmed that, then you can go ahead and make a diagnosis. Right. So we've got a needle core here, many fragments, and we go to higher power, and fairly quickly, we're impressed by the lack of air spaces. Yeah, this right? doesn't look anything like normal lung. Nothing like normal lung. So if you could imagine and conceptualize for a minute what this needle core would look like on radiology, on either an x-ray or a CT scan, this is going to look far more white yeah. than the normal lung surrounding it. A density. So yeah. we feel pretty good yeah. that we have sampled a mass lesion. So they have not swung and missed. Right. They have hit the mass lesion. So now we know we've got an older male, we've got a mass lesion, and we know they've hit the mass lesion. So our big question right now, what's the cause? Cancer or not. Right. Cancer or not. Right. Now, is every mass in the lung a cancer? Of course not. Every mass in the lung is cancer, but that's the most uh, pressing question at this point. It does seem like that's the problem most of the time when you get needles. But I think it's always important to remember that a bunch of things can make nodular masses in the lung, that's true. including... Sarcoidosis. Absolutely. Usually multiple mass lesions. It's Rarely scary. do needle cores from multiple mass lesions, but right. it does happen. Right. But I'll tell you, initially when you look at this, you're pretty concerned about wow. glandular proliferation. Glandular proliferation, atypia, prominent nu nucleoli, pleomorphism. We have some smaller cells and some bigger cells. We have some cells that are falling off here a little bit. I mean, they're making glands. They're making glands. So we're not worried about is this squamous cell carcinoma right. or adenocarcinoma. But I'll tell you, I mean, there's a lot of atypia here. Yeah. These so is your big. The vast majority of people are going to be highly concerned about adenocarcinoma. Right. And in fact, some people will go ahead and make the diagnosis here of right. adenocarcinoma. And sometimes you're going to be right. Yeah, but that diagnosis is a particularly painful diagnosis to be wrong on. Yeah. No, it's one that will burn for a really long time. So we're, we're going to help you guys navigate this. You're going to run into these if you haven't already. This is a really challenging case uh, for a number of reasons. So, Max, when you look at a case like this and you're worried about adenocarcinoma, what are the, the sort of bullet points that you like to hit, the checklist you like to go through to make sure you don't um, really step into it? Well, actually, at the very top of my checklist, when I'm thinking about needle core biopsies and I'm worried about the diagnosis of adenocarcinoma, the very top thing actually is the pearl yeah. for this case. And Makes the pearl sense. for this case is that use extreme caution in diagnosing adenocarcinoma in the setting of acute lung injury. Right. Extreme caution, which means if you have acute lung injury and a needle core biopsy, and you're worried about adenocarcinoma, just take it one step back. Yep. If you're gonna call it cancer, 
and there's a cute lung injury, call it suspicious. Or atypia. I'm if you're going to call it suspicious and there's a cute lung injury, call it atypia. Yeah. Because we've seen, we personally, and we've seen every good pulmonary pathologist go down the tubes. Well, I would say we've seen even the best pulmonary pathologist go down the tubes on this. Absolutely. So it, it is a huge pitfall in pulmonary pathology and one that every pathologist has to face because this is not a wedge biopsy you're going to be able to send to Max Smith and get an answer on. This is something that's in your wheelhouse. That's right. You got to deal with this. So now people are sitting there watching this video going, wait a minute, they didn't show me any acute lung injury. Right. What we in better, the world's going on here? We better look at the thing, huh? So, but, but this is the problem, right? Yeah. Your eye gets drawn to these atypical cells, this proliferation, and you're just, you, we're pathologists. This right. is what we do for, yeah. for a living is we, we look and decide is a cancer or not, at least the, non -ne the neoplastic pathologists, yeah. that's what they do for a living. And so you just get drawn into this, and before you know it, you haven't even taken the time to look the context to the whole for thing. some of the rest of the features yeah. we're talking about. So acute lung injury. We've got a lesion here that some people are concerned about diagnosing adenocarcinoma. What in the heck is right next door here? That looks like a necrosis. That looks like necrosis. And in fact, on the other end, More that necrosis. is definitively wow. necrosis. Now, this is not necrosis in the tumor, is it? And it's not tumor cell necrosis. Right. This looks like... A patch of necrosis. Prankable. Now, that's weird in the lung. Yeah. To have parenchymal necrosis yeah. in the lung, that's bizarre. Right. Now, so we have necrosis. What's this? Organizing pneumonia. That is a polyp of organizing pneumonia. An immature <laughs> proliferation of fibroblastic tissue sitting in the airspace. It's a signal. It's telling us that that necrosis is having an impact in this area we're worried about. It's waving a flag. It is. And written on the flag says, don't diagnose cancer. Here's another polyp of organizing yeah. pneumonia. Yeah. Wow, the more you look, the scarier that gets. It, it, there's something about this atypia, too, that bothers me. You know, I, on my checklist, yeah, look for acute injury because yep. it's going to downplay whatever you see. Yep. Second thing is I get into a place where I can clearly see the epithelium and I hunt for cilia. Ah, the cilia question, of course. Now, this case, actually, <laughs> if you look around... <laughs> it's got cilia. Okay, now that's another one. If you were thinking suspicious, you'd back it down to atypia, possibly reactive. If you're thinking carcinoma, you'd back it down probably to atypia uncertain. Right. Now, if you've got cilia here, this used to be an alveolar wall. It's been remodeled by whatever is going on in this Maybe patient. Maybe metaplastic. This right? is metaplastic, yeah. right? Yeah. Now, are there any immunostains you can use in the setting of metaplasia? That would be, be cool. helpful. Because if I could use an immunostain I have in my lab to solve this, because you know all the people I work with are out of town this week. And you've got nobody to show it to. No one to show right. it to. But I do have immunostains. So is there one I can use in my lab? Give so, it to me. As it turns out, I find this this panel of stains, two stains, TTF1 and P40, yeah. right? And in peribronchiolar metaplasia, you'll have this little sprinkling of P40 positive basal cells in the setting of peribronchiolar metaplasia. No matter how atypical it is. No matter how atypical. In adenocarcinoma, you see no P40 positive basal cells. So if you're not sure if you're seeing cilia or not, it's a great trick. Get a TTF1, it'll highlight all the atypical pneumocytes, and if there's no P40 positive cells, then you should be more suspicious for adenocarcinoma. Right. But in a case like this, you'll see this sprinkling of right. P40 positive right. cells. Yeah, it's a parachute. It'll save you. The cool. other thing about this case is this idea of a windswept appearance. Yeah. I know this is one of your favorites. It is because, you know, uh, the cartoon in my head for adenocarcinoma is rigid. The, the cells of adenocarcinoma in the lung tend to stand up rigidly. Their cytoplasm is rigid. The, the nuclei are cartoonishly large. And in this case, I think we see a mixture of how the atypia and the cytoplasm work together. Sometimes it looks like the wind has blown the cell, the cytoplasm, and the nucleus 
uh, in, in kind of a... Into the side. Yeah, to the side. So it's not a tombstone standing yeah, up anymore. Good point. Good one. But it's like a tree that's been blown over on its side, like yeah. this. Yep. Like Wind a Christmas swept. tree. Yep, like a Christmas it's tree. It's been out back and blown over. Yep. The last thing about this case that I'll just mention real quickly is that adenocarcinoma is usually hyperchromatic. Yeah. And these cells are, very, are fairly variable. hypochromatic. Yeah. Yeah. And you have these little tiny pinpoint nucleoli. Yep. Features that you see in the setting of, of reactive atypia. Yeah. So the pearl for this case, pearl number three, use extreme caution in diagnosing adenocarcinoma in the setting of acute lung injury. And if you remember that throughout your career, you'll save yourself from embarrassment. And pain. More than once. Yeah, a lot of pain. Great. Well, thank you for uh, joining us, and I hope you enjoyed this video. And uh, let us know uh, what you think of it down what, below. By the way, Max, what did this end up being? Ah, the follow-up, <laughs> of course. So they weren't sure. They weren't sure about this diagnosis of adenocarcinoma that was rendered on the outside. And uh, actually, they followed the patient, and the lesion that they were worried about initially by imaging started to resolve on its own after they started treating this patient for aspiration. Oh, so clinically he looked like an aspirator. He looked like an aspirator. So the lesion wasn't as pet positive as you, you would expect to see. Yep. Wild peribronchular metaplasia, tissue necrosis. Extensive. He could have had a little hunk of food in there even, and that might have, like, well, just the icing on the cake, but unfortunately. But certainly they wouldn't give us that piece to no, make the diagnosis. of course not. So. All right. Thanks a lot.